When it comes to the subject of TV finales, there tends to be a few reoccurring shows that often populate the debate on the best or worst endings to the greatest shows ever made. Six Feet Under, Breaking Bad, The Good Place, or The Big Bang Theory, for example, ended their runs with fan-favorite episodes, closing out a few of the most innovative and most influential shows out there. On the other hand, programs like Supernatural, Game of Thrones, How I Met Your Mother, and Dexter all found themselves against fan backlash for years after the closing credits. But as often as TV fans discuss this topic, a few shows have blurred the line on where audience opinions really stands when talking about their final episode. Lost, The Sopranos, and Seinfeld have all adapted a love-it-or-hate-it title for their respective finales. Audiences split on whether the characters they've watched for years truly were given proper send-offs, and if or not the episode subtly reflected the quality of these shows, either for better or for worse. But in all these examples, there seems to be one show in particular that has a tendency to get swept under the rug and forgotten about, saying elsewhere. You'd be forgiven if not immediately recognizable to you, considering the immense popularity of other medical dramas of today, like Grey's Anatomy or Chicago Med, and it's often cited comparisons to its more successful sister show, Hill Street Blues. But for all its struggles fitting in into today's TV landscape compared to other big 80s dramas, St. Elsewhere has one major ace up its sleeve, unequivocally making it one of the most important TV shows of all time, all hidden deep in its series finale. Asking anyone today what they think of the last one will net you a bevy of different responses. Some believe it without a doubt is single-handedly the only TV episode in existence and literally created all of TV as we know it. Others criticize it to an oblivion, citing the fact that it practically undermines the entirety of the medium due to logistical impossibilities people have made for 35 years and how it ruined one of the best shows of the 80s. Some have more nuanced explanations and opinions on the episode and what its final shot actually means. And if you're sitting there watching this with absolutely no clue as to what any of this is referring to, that's okay. Because as much information as there is online, no one person has ever collected it all and presented it out in an in-depth documentary until today. As I walk you through the craziest, most wild, ambitious project ever to be formed in TV history. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tommy Westfall universe. As hard as it might be to believe, the origins of this story begin with one of the most prominent TV actresses of the 60s and 70s by the name of Mary Tyler Moore. Probably best known for her performances on shows like The Dick Van Dyke Show and her self-titled sitcom, many people aren't also aware that she co-founded one of the most influential TV production studios of the time with then-husband Grant Tinkler, named MTM Enterprises. The company, despite being independent for its first 20 years, flexed its muscle in the world of TV comedy with massive hits, most notably the aforementioned Mary Tyler Moore Show and its respective spin-offs, Rhoda, Phyllis, and Lou Grant, as well as The Bob Newhart Show, often considered one of the greatest TV shows ever made. In the 70s, MTM and CBS co-owned the CBS Studio Center in LA, this would be the primary in-house studio for MTM, and because of this, almost all of MTM's programs had to be broadcasted on CBS. This relationship started to wear on Tinkler, who simultaneously held a position at 20th Century Fox, but was forced to quit in order to avoid a conflict of interest. Coincidentally, News Corporation, owners of Fox and its subsidies, would later purchase MTM in 1997. But as far as Tinkler goes, a new opportunity opened up when in the summer of 1981, Fred Silverman, president of NBC, resigned. This was also around the time Tinkler and Moore got a divorce, and with that came a swift chain reaction for these companies. Tinkler became president of NBC 
taking over for Silverman, leaving MTM in the process. And due to pressure from NBC's lawyers, Tinkler also sold off his remaining stock of MTM, which was bought by Moore and Arthur Price, a chairman working for MTM at the time. Price was later named president of MTM in the wake of Tinkler's departure, and over at NBC, Brandon Tartikoff became in charge of their entertainment division. All of this happening in the span of less than a year really shook up the TV industry, shaping what was to come for NBC in the 80s. Between Tartikoff's and Tinkler's experience and long-standing passion for TV, the two of them would usher in a new era for NBC, which is still credited to this day for saving the network and putting them back on top. Sitcoms that premiered around this time included fan favorites like Family Ties, Silver Spoons, Mama's Family, Gimme a Break, and Cheers. But it was in the wide array of exciting new dramas where the two men really found their stride. The A-Team became the network's biggest new hit, finishing in the top 10 of the Nielsen rank and improving its placement multiple times in its later seasons, peaking at number 4. But plenty of other dramas would slowly but surely climb their way to the top of the ratings and gain critical support. Hill Street Blues most prominently would kickstart the decade and introduce Stephen Brocco as one of the industry's most promising new creators. Brocco would later go on to develop all sorts of different shows and become a trendsetter in various avenues. Such examples included the John Ritter-led Hooperman, which was considered by many the vanguard for the genre of dramedy, Capital Critters as one of the first adult animated shows on TV, or Doogie Howser MD, that would influence shows like Scrubs for its 30-minute medical show format. Of course, Brocco would also go on to create two of the world's most recognizable cop dramas outside of Hill Street Blues, LA Law and NYPD Blue. But he wasn't the only producer contributing to NBC's newfound revival. Robert Butler, a famed TV director, would create Remington Steel, a crime drama starring Pierce Brosnan, which brought in between 15 and 20 million viewers an episode. Glenn A. Larson, previously known for Quincy M.E., The Fall Guy, and Magnum P.I., pitched Knight Rider, a futuristically styled action drama led by David Hasselhoff as Michael Knight, which was a smash hit with viewers. And most interestingly of all, Joshua Brand and John Falsey, creators of St. Elsewhere, a humble enough medical drama following the lives of the doctors and patients set in the fictional St. Eligius Hospital. While most of these shows were goofy, over-the-top 80s cheese fests, which were all able to carve out a solid spot for themselves in the ratings, the latter was gritty, realistic, and challenging, something most TV networks ignored, as did audiences, at least at first. Between 1982 and 1983, 96 different shows were broadcasted across the three major networks. CBS placed first across the board, mostly due to their lineup of fantastic dramas like Simon & Simon, Falcon Crest, and Dallas, as well as 60 Minutes, their famed long-running news magazine show that scored number one in the ratings. ABC came comfortably in second, mostly thanks to comedies like 9 to 5, Three's Company, and The Love Boat. Not to mention their coverage of Monday Night Football, which firmly held its spot at number 10. NBC around this time, still dealing with the shakeup of their executives, failed to deliver, with only two shows placing in the top 30 and owning more than half of the bottom 20 slots. Of those bottom 20, St. Elsewhere ranked 87 out of 96 for the entire TV season, and was the only show in the bottom 10 to get renewed. It could have ended up like all the other dramas of the time, cancelled after its first season, but due to its original presentation, critics immediately fell in love. During its second season, the series climbed up to the 70th most popular series, despite there being even more competition. Critical reviews were getting better, as well as storylines grew more complex, and characters expressed deeper feelings than what had been seen on TV up until this point. Season 3, which finished in the spring of 1985, was the show's best yet. NBC finished the season in second place, beating out ABC, finally breaking a streak of disappointing finishes in the Nielsen ranks. 
St. Elsewhere was a major contributor, creeping up all the way into the top 50 biggest shows on air. The season also saw its main demo, 18 to 49 viewers, significantly increase. To this day, the 18 to 49 demo is the most valuable for many TV networks to hit, with some shows resting on the success they're able to generate from these viewers alone. 40 years ago, St. Elsewhere was proving that in action, why that was the case. It also featured the episode My Aim is True, the best reviewed of the entire series. Season 4 gave the best critical responses yet, with many praising the series leads for some of the best performances TV had to offer. To this day, this season has the best average score by fans on sites like Ratings Graph and IMDb. This year was also the show's most successful when it came to its Emmy performance, winning 3 out of its 10 nominations. Despite this, the show would slip to 53, tied alongside Knight Rider. But NBC having confidence in this show, finally had put itself back on top, with 10 shows ranking in the top 20, and it managing to take the top spot in over a decade with The Cosby Show. As a result, CBS and ABC tried to push out their own dramas in an attempt to replicate the success of NBC with little to no success. For the remainder of St. Elsewhere's run, NBC would stay on top, continuing its dominance that's lasted to this very day. Even through new competition like the debut of Fox in 1987, no one else was able to topple over NBC. As for St. Elsewhere, though the peak of season 4 brought critical numbers to an all-time high, the show would slowly wear off with more casual viewers as the series would stay stagnant for another two years. And eventually, NBC and MTM Enterprises who had produced the show from day one decided to pull the plug. But not before one more episode that would change TV forever. On May 25th, 1988, after a respectable 137 episodes, St. Elsewhere came to an end, with the final episode of the series that would prove more than influential. The last one aired to 22.5 million viewers, ranking in the top 10 most viewed hours of TV the week it premiered. The episode's story was one of the most shocking for many, featuring the departures of Dr. Fiscus and Morrison and the death of Dr. Oshlander as well as the return of Dr. Westfall, played by Ed Flanders, who for the final season only appeared as a reoccurring character. While many fans were satisfied with how the acclaimed medical drama finished, many individuals felt uneasy or confused over its final scene. This is the point in the story where Tommy Westfall becomes an important name to remember. Played by child actor Chad Allen, Tommy is the son of Dr. Westfall, and had first appeared in the Season 2 episode, All About Eve. While at first Tommy is portrayed as someone who is difficult to take care of due to his severe autism, with the plot of the episode revolving around the doctor having to find a replacement sitter after his regular quits, Tommy gradually phases into becoming one of the brightest minds on the show, with an increased presence in the final episode. During the final scene, Tommy and his father are seen watching the snow fall from inside the hospital when just like that, the scene cuts to Tommy sitting on the floor looking into a snow globe, with Oshlander sitting behind him reading the newspaper. At that moment, Dr. Westfall enters the room, returning home from work with a construction uniform on, implying that this Westfall is not the same person we know from the rest of the series, but instead a different version from an alternate universe. He greets Oshlander and then observes Tommy shaking the snow globe, and it's in that moment that TV changed forever when Westfall says this. I don't understand this autism thing, Pop. Here's my son. I talk to him. I don't even know if he can hear me. He sits there all day long in his own world, staring at that toy. About. The three then leave the room as they get ready for dinner, when the camera slowly pans into the snow globe that Tommy has been staring into, and inside we see a tiny toy replica of St. Eligius, the same exact hospital the entire show had been set for the last six years. 
the final shot lingers a bit as the snow falls over the hospital, and the credits start to roll and end marks one of TV's most polarizing and most profound endings of all time. The last one received plenty of discussions when it first aired, and still to this day, sports a respectable 8.2 out of 10 on IMDb, making it one of the highest rated finales in TV history. But similarly, it's quite easy to find plenty of people who despise this episode, comparing its writing to numerous infamous TV finishes where the entirety of the show ends with it all being a dream. And while the most commonly accepted theory is just that, it all being a dream in Tommy's mind, some super fans have taken this concept to the extreme. As mentioned previously, the Dr. Westfall that enters the room is seen wearing construction clothes, implying that he's not a doctor, leading to the thought that Tommy has imagined his father as a doctor working in the hospital inside his favorite snow globe. We also know that Tommy is autistic, and it's often been reported that people who are autistic can have vivid imaginations and can create complex stories, the way that St. Elsewhere is presented over the six seasons it aired for. Assuming that this is indeed true, that Tommy has imagined all of the events on the show on his own, it's fun to theorize about what else potentially he thought up. TV has had a long-standing tradition of cross-promotion and crossovers. Some of the best franchises on TV have been built off the backs of crossovers, in fact. And back in the 1980s, this was no different. Cheers, the season 3 finale of St. Elsewhere, sees the lead gang visit a local Boston bar where everyone knows your name. Characters like Norm, Cliff, and Carla all make appearances confirming the two shows are canonically set in the same universe. Due to Elsewhere's popularity and Cheers being a white-hot staple of the NBC lineup, it made a lot of sense to cross-promote the two shows with one another in a crossover special like this, not to mention both shows being set in Boston, of course. But while Cheers is the most famous crossover of the series, it wouldn't be the only one. Byron Stewart, who played hospital orderly Warren Coolidge, actually made his first on-screen appearance as the character on a different show prior to St. Elsewhere's creation, that show being CBS's cult basketball drama The White Shadow, connecting the two shows just like Cheers did. Later on in 1993, Tom Fantana, a writer and producer for Elsewhere, would be part of the creative team behind Homicide Life on the Street a dirty, grungy series about the fictional Baltimore Police Department and their trials and tribulations working in the Homicide Department. Two characters from St. Elsewhere, Dr. Roxanne Turner and Dr. Ehrlich, would appear at various points in Homicide. Turner in the season 6 episode Mercy, for which actress Alfie Woodward would be nominated for Outstanding Guest Actress in a Drama Series at the 50th Primetime Any Awards and Dr. Ehrlich in Homicide the Movie, the made-for-TV movie that closed out the series on February 13, 2000, almost as an El Camino type of movie to tie up all the loose story ends. Now, let's pause here for just one second. If we are indeed led to believe that Tommy Westfall is responsible for all of the events and characters and mishaps and victories that we see portrayed over the six seasons of St. Elsewhere, then those characters end up on other programs like The White Shadow and Homicide Life on the Street, then is it reasonable to assume that those shows are as well, all the events and characters and mishaps and victories, are also part of the Tommy Westfall universe? I mean, think about it. Tommy creates these characters and all of these different events that are portrayed but then expands them out into different settings and locations, but they all lead back to his mind. And then what if there were connections to other shows based on Homicide or The White Shadow? For example, the character of John Munch, who originated on Homicide Life on the Street, has been seen on other shows like Law & Order SVU, The Wire, and The X-Files. 
And then what if those shows had different props or different characters expand outward to shows like Veronica Mars and Two and a Half Men and Prison Break and Breaking Bad and Malcolm in the Middle and even Chicago PD. And then those shows expand out to programs like The Walking Dead and FBI and Dharma and Greg and Lost and Moonlighting and Breakout Kings. And then those shows also have connections to places like Better Call Saul, The Office UK, Glee, FBI Most Wanted, and Kingdom Hospital, eventually expanding out into hundreds and hundreds of different shows that all lead back to one child's mind. It may seem like a bit of a reach to some, but when you start formulating and putting the pieces together, it starts to make a lot of sense. All of this drafted up into becoming what we now know as the Tommy Westfall Universe Grid, a project that was originated by two incredibly passionate TV fans, acting almost as though they were farmers, caring for a seed that was planted decades prior. Of course, that seed being St. Elsewhere's infamous finale. And over time, they cared and they looked at and they found connections, laying out all the small but significant details into mapping out one of TV's greatest mysteries, with the first draft of it being published in 2003 on their websites. Back in 1999, Keith Gow and Ash Crow started formulating the Tommy Westfall universe with other fans of St. Elsewhere and Homicide Life on the Street, realizing the two shows had a lot of crossover potential. As mentioned earlier, Cheers was one of the first shows that crossed over with Elsewhere, and the obvious next show to connect to Cheers was Frasier, the fan-favorite spinoff that saw Kelsey Grammer return as Dr. Frasier Crane. The pair then found that Caroline and the City, another NBC sitcom, connected through the episode Caroline and the Bad Back, in which Frasier characters Daphne and Niles appear. One of the biggest pop culture phenomenons at the time was yet another NBC sitcom by the name of Friends, which amazingly connected to Caroline and the City with a cameo appearance from Matt Perry's Chandler Bing in the episode Caroline and the Folks. And that was just the start, as dozens of other shows would slowly but surely be added until the first grid featuring over 100 different series was published in 2003. While this was incredibly impressive, Gao and Crow would chip away at the puzzle and add more and more shows as time went on. And by 2016, over 400 different TV shows many of which were still airing at the time or even to this very day, would find their home in the Tommy Westfall universe. There is so, so much awesome TV compounded into this one chart. Nearly anything you can think of from old school favorites like I Love Lucy, Dragnet, and The Brady Bunch, to more modern shows like The Walking Dead and Dexter, and even entire franchises like Law & Order, Degrassi, NCIS, Criminal Minds, Star Trek, and even the entire Disney Channel sitcom collection. Needless to say, there is a fuck ton of shows to look over on this grid. And for 2016, this was excellent progress in decoding the mystery that is the Tommy Westfall universe. But unfortunately, both Gao and Crow have seemed to have stepped away from the project. Their website hasn't been updated since 2016, and each of their Twitter pages also seem to be inactive. But luckily, a few dedicated folks have stepped in to continue chipping away and keep the mystery alive thanks to the Tommy Westfall Universe wiki. This thing is fantastic, and the community members seem to be incredibly active and dedicated to updating it with very important, you know, modern info, uh, regular updates. There is a forum post there. There's forum discussions. This is definitely the place to be if you want to stay connected into what happens with this project in the future. And even more modern shows uh, that have since aired since 2016, like 911, Good Girls, uh, Law and Order, Organized Crime, they all have pages here on the wiki since 
uh, Go and uh, Crow have since stepped down. Those shows have all found connections to other shows that are already established to be part of the Tommy Westfall universe, and the more shows that are found, the easier it becomes to find clues in other shows that haven't been yet solved for. So if you want a place to work with others and find more connections, this is definitely the place to be definitely recommended. However, I do have to kind of question at some points what exactly the ultimate goal of this thing is. Because finding connections in these shows is a ton of fun, but is that really the end game here? Was this just kind of a punchline that got out of hand, or maybe it's something else entirely? Whatever the case is, it's simply just a theory. And at the end of the day, like all good theories, there are millions of different ways to look at it. The Tommy Westfall universe is often seen preferenced online with the word hypothesis attached to it. Because that's exactly what it is. A hypothesis, a theory, but not just any theory, a fan theory. Fans like Keith Gow and Ash Crow, who put together the initial draft of this grid. Fans who watched Sane Elsewhere back in 1988 and were perplexed or confused by its finale, reaching and searching for a deeper meaning, contacting other fans on message boards, staying up till three in the morning. It's why theories are so inviting and so exciting to TV fans. And that's what this channel was built on, giving you guys a glimpse into some of my personal favorite shows and characters so that we can have healthy community discussions and discourse surrounding the medium that we all love. And that's why this theory in particular is so unique and so fascinating. Because what if Walter White and Buffy Summers and Batman and Haley Upton all did find themselves in the same place? How would they interact with one another? Would they get along or would they try to fight each other? And how would those events affect the timelines that they all live in? It's an interesting question, and it's one that many people have already pondered online in several different places. TV at times can be a lot to take in and it can often be super dense to try to figure out on your own. And that's why places like Reddit have popped up and have become just such great platforms for these types of discussions to thrive on. Message boards, community discussions, you name it, they have it. And Tommy Westfall specifically encapsulates all the best things about fan theories. It perfectly demonstrates exactly why these discussions need to thrive long after these shows have since stopped airing. And it's perfectly reasonable to assume that you're going to have different viewpoints on it. If you've seen this entire documentary and you're still not convinced that this is one that you should pay attention to, well let me leave you with one final thought. Mary Tyler Moore, the woman who kicked off this story appears as part of the Tommy Westfall universe. Not just as Mary Richards, her character from the Mary Tyler Moore show and its respective spin-offs, but also as Mary Tyler Moore, the actress, the woman that was born on December 29th, 1936 in Brooklyn, and the woman who died on January 25th, 2017 in Connecticut. The woman who is married to Grant Tinkler and who started MTM Enterprises, the company responsible for all these great sitcoms and Hill Street Blues and St. Elsewhere. Mary Tyler Moore played herself in two different episodes of Ellen, a show that was already previously established to be part of the Tommy Westfall universe. And by that logic, that means that the universe that Mary Tyler Moore, the actress, lived in is also part of the Tommy Westfall universe. And of course, that universe is the universe that you and me live in, the universe that gave us all these great shows like Breaking Bad, Law and & Order, and St. Elsewhere. It's the universe that gave us all of the great finales as much as it gave us bad finales, as much as it gave us finales as well that would be questionable, or we would be perplexed by, such as 
St. Elsewhere's. It's the universe with Keith Gow and Ash Crow, the originators of the theory itself. So given all of that, is it possible that Tommy Westfall himself is responsible for the creation of this universe and all the events and characters and mishaps and victories that we know all too well? Is it possible that Tommy Westfall created us? Well, that, my friends, is a discussion that I'll leave you guys to have in the comments below.